the queries you received in the registration form. So make sure that you leave all your questions in the chat. And also in the ending of the session, we'll allow you to unmute yourself and ask all your doubts to the panelists directly. Also, after the session, we'll be releasing the lecture zero, uh, as we had mentioned in the mail, which will act as a precursor to the BSA session material and will act as a uh, great, multi great bridge between CS101 and all the technical sessions that will be conducted between 13th and 27th June. And for all the updates related to that, make sure to uh, join our Telegram channel. And that is, uh, make sure you join the Telegram channel. Uh, I think we still don't have Ayush, right? No. Uh, should we begin with the session? Yeah, I think we should go with it. Okay. Uh, okay, so a quick intro of the panelists. Uh, so as a panelist, we have uh, Akash Kapoor. Uh, hello, Akash. Hello. He's muted, I think. Oh. I think you Hello, Akash. Uh, hi. Yeah, I was uh, an attendee apparently, so I was not able to <laughs> unmute myself. Hi. Um, so do I like give an intro or something about me? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, I'm Akash uh, from, I'm a bachelor, uh, ex-bachelor student from electrical engineering. Um, kind of switched up my profile really uh, when I took up the job. Uh, currently I work in uh, on-device machine learning. So it's pretty, inter it's a pretty interesting field. Uh, because it's a technical, because you're technically interested, I took up a minus in CS, and I guess other things we can discuss as we go along. Here. And uh, one more thing, uh, can you all mention why you chose the specific company? Is there something, is, was there a specific reason you chose that company or you chose to do yeah. an intern in that company? Yeah, so I mean, uh, specifically, for example, my field that I mentioned, um, this area of research that we are working in. You want the company to, uh, you want to work in a company where you control both the software stack and the hardware stack. So it's kind of limits you to like Apple or Google or Samsung, so which have their actual devices in the market. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why I actually went for this one. Oh, thanks. Uh, next we have Akabaka Saikrin. Yeah. Uh, am I audible and all? Yes. So I'm Sai Kiran. Uh, I just finished my third year in CS and I'm doing an internship at Microsoft ML right now. And it's been what five weeks. Uh, that's about it, I guess. And as to why I chose Microsoft. So in third year, um, usually people don't uh, go that selective. I mean, so I had applied to a bunch of companies and Microsoft ML uh, was one of the two that I had got shortlisted into and the interviews went fine and I was happy with the with the offer. And if it's okay, can you also share what you're working on there? Mm, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, for other, I mean, my non-disclosure isn't that. I mean, so, so it's like it's an ML problem uh, where it's classification of ads. So an ad has a text component and an image component. So currently the systems at Microsoft, they use uh, two different models, uh, a text model and an image model, and then combine the scores using a simple classifier. And so what I'm trying to do is to implement a recent multi-model model. So it takes in both of these as input and see whether it gives any gains. If this if this is too technical, then I mean. Uh, that, that really went over my head. So it's fine, right? It's a broad audience. So it, it, it's just an ML problem. It's just an eight week internship, so there's not that much we can do. But yeah. Okay, uh, so our next speaker we have Sabya Sachi Nayak. Uh, well, I completed my third year in CS and uh, yeah. I mean, there's not much to say, so 
uh, anything about the intern that you're doing? Yeah, so in my intern, we have this software for each client. So what uh, I am assigned to is we have to provide it on the cloud, over the cloud. And basically, we are in the interface designing part. Okay. okay. I, I mean, I am in the interface designing part. Yeah. Uh, and next we have Tarush Goel. So, uh, hi everyone. This is Tarush. I have just also just like Sai Kiran, I have completed my third year at Computer Science IIT Bombay. And uh, yeah, I'm doing an internship at DE Shaw. The theme is data analysis primarily and I can't disclose much about it um, because of the NDAs, but it's primarily Python and data analysis. Uh, and our fifth speaker is not here right now. Uh, he is Ayush Kadam and he's in. I think he has joined. Okay, I think he has, has joined. Yeah. Uh, Ayush. Sorry, sorry, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Ayush Kadam. Uh, I just completed my third year at uh, in computer science, and I'm doing an internship in Google right now. Software development internship. Ayush, uh, if it's okay, can you also turn on a video? Hi. Uh, so we're done with the introduction. So now coming to the internship process. As of now, the official timeline hasn't been released by the college yet. But based on the past years, a tentative timeline goes as follows. So for the third year students, the resume submission date uh, lies in around the second or third week of July. And in the fee, uh, week following that, following the resume submission, all the tests by the companies are conducted. And in the month of August, all the companies start to come for interview. So this is the basic timeline for the internship uh, session, uh, internship process for the third years. And for the second years, uh, it happens uh, usually a little late in the month of September. And the session and the workshops for the internship uh, uh, session are conducted before the midsems. And the submission for the uh, resume is after our midsem. But this, this is all just tentative and uh, the official timeline is, uh, is yet to be released by the college. Uh, so, uh, so the, this was the uh, tentative timeline, but uh, before talking about the timeline, it is also important to know about the profile and the prerequisites of uh, the software and IT uh, sector. And can you guys explain on that, uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, so I guess I'll start off with it. Um, so we want to know the different profiles that are available. So I mean, uh, there are multiple problems that you can tackle. So for example, uh, you can work as a software developer, but then you can work in some sort of a... So first thing to know is that you, who are your clients, right? So you can have a business to business client, you can have a business to consumer client, and for example, so in software development, primarily you'll be working on uh, implementing different solutions depending on the client's needs. So this can be uh, web-related development, this can be an app-related development, this can be some sort of a, any internal platform development, you can be doing a lot of that. Um, obviously data analysis is another big field, so you can have uh, a data analysis and data management. Uh, at, at sometimes it's also combined. So for example, you can have uh, databasing management and data analysis, and then you'll be using different tools for the job. So there are a, a few famous tools that if you search up, you'll uh, look up them. Um, next, actually, you can also move on to networking stack, for example. And I do not mean web development, I mean networking as in the implementation of protocols. You can have 5G, for example, or 60, for example. It's not totally hardware. A lot of that component is also software design and how do you want to process your signals. So that is one stack that you can work on. Uh, web development obviously is there. And the ever growing more popular stack at this moment is the machine learning stack that you work on. So even in that you can actually have multiple 
subfields as well. So, for example, you could be working on device inference. So, you could be optimizing for server inference. So, you could be, uh, I don't know, you want to train models that uh, do one specific server task well, or do you want to train them for a device? What really do you want to do? So, it's a very big uh, subfield, really. And obviously, uh, there's yet another one in uh, the coding side of things, which is very popular, is how to manage uh, cloud systems and deployments. So cloud uh, systems, containerization, how do you manage uh, Docker? How do you work with AWS, for example? That's another big field. And again, uh, there's yet another, which is sysadmins. So you can also be a sysadmin. But then these days, sysadmin has actually merged with cloud. And it has kind of become this one integrated DevOps profile. So there's a lot of variety that is available to you. Um, this is, to the best of my knowledge, I'm pretty sure the other panelists would like to inform us more about it. Uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just would like to add that uh, most of, like from what I've seen, a lot of companies like they actually provide a mixture of these uh, fields, and so you shouldn't be uh, like very fixated on one of them, and you should be open to like it's good to have one, it's good to have a passion, but you should be open in all the profiles. Because it's the real power will always lie in uh, like in a, in a combination of these fields. Um, if I may add something, so when they give out the profile of SW, let's say at Microsoft, and you don't know what you'll be working for, and all of this happens much later. So uh, when you are applying, so then you only have uh, a few broad areas to apply to. You have SW, you have fintech, financial tech, technical stuff, you have trading, and you have ML. So it's like all these fields uh, come to play when you're actually doing your internship. So, yeah, as Taro said, uh, it's good to be open. I think, Sabisachi, you had something to add. Yeah, I mean, they covered all of it, sir. OK, OK. So this was basically about the profiles, but what about the prerequisites? And I know that some profiles have some certain prerequisites, so can we elaborate on that as well? Uh, I think I'll start this one. So as a prerequisite, they also know that uh, the students applying are second year and most companies will have internship tests. So it would also be about uh, accuracy and uh, time management a bit. Uh, although it is, uh, it does not uh, come down to that a lot. I think that's mainly it. They don't expect a lot being because they know that we are second year students at now and we'll be doing after completing our third year. We'll be doing the internship. So they know that we learn a lot in the time duration. So uh, like from what I felt from experience was that a lot of the interviewers, they actually ask you as to which courses you have done or which topics you are comfortable in and then our questions from that topic or a course because uh, they uh, like they know that you will learn things eventually like in the th in third year and they they don't like even i think uh, so sai kiran can elaborate more like on ml as a profile well the two things which are like common to all the companies are uh, competitive coding and your confidence and communication skills yeah so that was also there for microsoft except for ml, prof ML profiles uh, they would like to see some projects which you've done um, be it a course project um, and something not very trivial or uh, preferably that they can ask you about and they can figure out how much you really know um, so because that's what you'll be working on and it's true that a lot of the learning really happens later so they just want to see if you're capable of learning and that sort of stuff. Yeah, I guess that's really the essential point of it that, you know, you even if you feel that you're probably not as qualified as other people, or even if you feel like, let's say you've not done projects in ML, or if you've not 
you're not very great at competitive coding now that we're having this session right now at least for competitive coding you can do something in the next two months but even let's say you feel that you're not very skilled in ml if you can uh, because the interview uh, because the internship technical test or if if there is one it will not really look into ml so really where the point of contact comes is your inter is your interview so even if your interview even if in your interview you can display a good grasp of your concept and if, if you can display that confidence and the ability to learn it can really still give you a fighting chance even if you don't have any projects just don't uh, think that you cannot do it i mean sure it helps if you have projects it always helps but if you don't then don't think you're disqualified automatically there is no as such hard criteria interviews decide everything uh, plus as far as ml is concerned honestly i can tell you that uh, e- even for third year interns the, the people who do it from third to fourth year it's not as if they're working on something extremely significant all the time anyways and even even when we joined as employees it's not like we started off doing by something very significant a lot of our initial days were just learning about things to get up to speed with what everyone else is doing so it's not as if you will go into it pre prepared that you will know that this is something to be done so they don't really expect that you to know everything but if you can show that understanding of the basics you can show that confidence that you have it in you and if you have for this great but just don't limit yourself is what i would say uh and i think someone mentioned about dsa and a lot of the uh, questions in the form were related to dsa so uh what would you say how big of a repeat visit is it for the companies for software based companies the knowledge about dsa i suppose dsa is pretty much the as much as competitive coding is not really something i prefer but the truth of the the truth of the world is that it kind of is the benchmark on which every software company likes to likes to uh, base the results of i mean sure you might be able to pull off an interview but a lot of companies will only shortlist you for interviews if you clear the technical test for which you need to know dsa at least at a minimum level you probably don't need to be one of the top coders within the country but you need to be good enough to get to that interview and have a chance so a few certain algorithms that i'll be covering and um, data structures that i'll be covering in the subsequent sessions i'm not going to be targeting everything as well only what we need at least to get to that interview stage everything else you can uh, figure out on your own as well but th- there is a- and also there's a lot of uh, merit in actually going through archives of previous year company specific questions because companies tend to repeat a pattern over time for example uh, certain companies like to focus on certain uh, data structures certain companies have a different way of asking questions so as long as you can uh, you know uh, optimize if let's say you're targeting a specific company if you can optimize for that that's good but dsa in general you need to make it strong they not ask what your grade in the dsa course was but you just need to demonstrate it in the technical test <laughs> uh do you have anything to add uh, anything else so i think that was it about the profile in the prerequisites so next is the most crucial part of the application process that is the resume and uh, can you please tell us about the resume and like, the things the guidelines while uh, keeping in uh, that we should keep in mind while making our resume while build, building it uh one important thing that i have i think is there is like you shouldn't add things you haven't done just to inflate your resume because uh they don't care if, they mostly wouldn't care about how many projects you have you have done but they can uh, it's very often that they are going to choose one of your projects and they are going to grill grill you on that project they are going to make sure that whatever is written there is the truth and then assume the same for other project so if you write something you haven't done even if like you you were one of the three members of a project 
then you should you should be prepared with exactly what part you did in that project and what was the bigger picture and you shouldn't be saying like okay i made the whole project because they're going to ask like very grilling questions and once they think that okay you probably didn't uh, do what you have written there it's like that is going to be like a very negative point Uh, yeah, I think this goes for uh, even if uh, you are writing only the things that you are doing. In that also, make sure that after uh, for the interviews, uh, whenever you are going, you should know everything whatever you have written, because they can pick anything and uh, talk to you about it. It doesn't matter if you have done and you don't remember, then it will give a wrong impression to the interviewer that you have just written it uh, for sake of writing. So do make sure that you know everything. Yeah, in the same spirit, for example, I've seen that a lot of people have a rush to complete the two pages of the two-page resume. Don't be worried about filling the two pages because you're a second-year student. No one expects you to have done so much. It's only been four semesters out of which one year was a fresh year. No one expects you to have so much projects and experience that you can fill two uh, two pages worth of a resume. So a lot of people tend to fill in their uh, Uh, resume with courses that they have taken that they've probably not done well in or anything just to fill that empty space or people that write n number of programming languages or tools that they've used without having for example they would have been introduced to that tool once probably might have used matlab once in their life but it's on their resume now although this does not usually happen a lot with uh, languages and stuff but for example if someone asks you to implement something in matlab seeing that you've written matlab in your code and if this is to once using stack overflow you're going to be in a bad spot you don't want to lose your credibility so don't care about filling it with quantity just focus on quality and wherever possible if you ever have the doubt i've seen this from a lot of my seniors stagger your skills so for example if you want to mention that i have these technical qualifications or these courses or i know these languages and tools a lot of people what they do and this also can be used to fill in your empty space if you so want is that they will stagger them that this is what i'm proficient in this is what i have a working knowledge in this is what i'm familiar in in that case they'll also target your questions accordingly because you've already been clear to them from the get go that okay this is something i'm familiar with so i can probably learn it in a quick time but i'm not so strong with it that you ask a question from me so that is another way if you want to fill in the empty space but preferably you just put in your strongest suits forward also i mean there's any way the general uh, advice that is taken that for example uh, for non tech resume you put certain sections above the project section for above the technical project section for the tech resume you put your projects first and then your pors and this uh, this general guidelines anyway still apply i'm pretty sure you the carousel would have a resume preparation session so i'm sure they've told you all this so depending on what you're targeting put that forward based on what they're looking because they get a, they get so many applications they don't want to go through all of them and they get tired so you they don't make them search for what you're writing like your skill might be something you would not have done a lot in it and let's say because of that you don't have much to write and you've put it at the end or somewhere in the second page don't do that if that is your skill even if you've not done much if that is your interest let it be front and center in the first page itself that's what they're looking for that's what you're looking for don't make them go through it uh so like you mentioned uh, a very important point is quality the uh, the the, uh, the quality and the skills so one uh, one more question is ki if someone has skills but he doesn't have the certificate or the, the course certificate for it does it still uh, hold value in a resume i mean sure you can structure your resume in such a way uh, at least in the second year level because at the second year to third year level sure you might not have a lot of opportunities you might not have been clear on what you want to work with that's why you don't have uh, projects or certifications to back it up so certainly for second year it becomes an optional like you can phrase it in such a way that these are my strengths i haven't done anything to show you but then these are my strengths and then you can just hope because you'll be grilled on your resume during the interview so if you have a skill 
and they see that it's mentioned at the top without any projects or anything if they ask you you can back it up during your interview for third year however people who are going from third year to fourth year it's always recommended that if you're mentioning something have some quantitative metric to back it up because by your third year people are expecting you to have settled down on something and have worked something on it it's it's not as if you can just write because then there are at the third year level there are a, a lot of people who have actually not only are skilled in a field but have also done some quantitative work to back it up so it may work for second year it probably will not work for third year and onwards but still if you don't have anything to write even let's say in your third year let's say you haven't been very clear on your choices even then even in the worst case scenario if you don't have anything to write put it up you never know what the interview is going to be like you never know what the interviewer wants to ask you this way at least you can control the interview in a way and controlling the interview is probably the biggest thing about any interview you don't want the interviewer to control it you want yourself to control the interview so you got to be confident you might be nervous you got to be confident they might be looking for skills you got to put your skills first because it's happened also it happened for example with one of my friends during our interview time in my session he went for a company he did not have the requisite skills the interviewer started the interview with the interview start he mentioned that i do not have these skills that you're looking for alternatively i have skills in these these things luckily the interviewer was also familiar with that field so the interviewer was like okay let's take your interview for these fields he took his interview and realized okay he is skilled in this field so he still got an internship offer in a different profile that the company had not advertised but because he took control of the interview he could still get he could still get through you never know with an interview what's going to happen so you have to put your best foot forward you cannot let the interviewer disappoint you so to to answer your question in short yes if if you have a skill second year please put it forward even if you don't have any work behind it third year probably not if first comes to us put it and if you're talking about certificates as in uh, for python courses from coursera or ml courses from coursera usually people do put them but i don't know how much of a value they have uh, in the sense that i think they have much credibility yeah i'm an online certificate yeah i mean uh, they are actually useful uh, but then make sure that you honestly have completed that course because it's very easy to get through coursera courses and get certifications without having done the work and if they see a coursera certification they will ask you questions on that i made a mistake once of putting my certification in uh, object oriented programming or something and they asked me concept i was not ready for so don't make that mistake of putting a certification if you have not done the work so i guess that was it ah uh, sabesh achi you are you are mute the environment is not really suitable and i had nothing to add so like don't worry okay 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 so, so i think we are done with the resume part so next up we have the test preparation so can you tell us about your test preparation and your experience add in the resume Achha, yes, yes. yeah so uh, like some people actually say that uh, you know make your resume very uh, should be filled completely there should not be much spaces in it but uh, like from what i experienced is like uh, also like i talked to some of the mentors in some companies and they said that uh, they also that it should be well organized and some spacing should be there it shouldn't be very cluttered otherwise thing it, it, it gets auto rejected like some companies even put it through some kind of algorithm and stuff so the point is that it shouldn't be very like the text shouldn't be too small and it shouldn't be very clustered it should be easy to read as well like you have to make a trade off between those two things oh and yeah a lot of this comes down to uh, look at a few of your senior resume so there is a pretty standard a uh, structure which you can uh, and so you can always 
like kind of pump up the font size if you don't have enough stuff to write which is what i did in my second year uh and I, yes, I mean, so you can show it around to uh, no i mean that's it so show it around and get some feedback on it but uh, like not too much so i mean you can in, in a lighter way and you can also think of it as something it's your first introduction to some person even if it's not an algorithm reading it which for example is a very important thing that tarush mentioned but even if it's not an algorithm reading it let's look at it from a different point of view what do you write in your tinder or bumble bios right it's your first introduction to the potential person who's going to swipe on you so you want it to be nice at the end of the day it's someone talk reading it your interview chance is when you get the match and you get to actually talk to that person but in a similar way don't overfill it with information because no one likes like i mean no one likes useless information that is filling up so much that they find it hard to read there's a lot of things involved it's like a, even if it's automatically processed sure a computer can make it into a nice format and they'll get only the relevant points but of the ones of chance that some, someone is reading it like okay uh, i'm getting bored so if that person gets bored you are losing out on points it's a social game as well as uh, organizational game it's a lot of uh, little little factors involved so keep it concise let it be readable give your uh, sentences room to breathe you know it should not be uh, like one of those big classical textbooks with such small font that you have to hold your book to close to your face to read it i think that's it right uh, on the resume so next up we have uh, the uh-huh. one uh, right. sorry uh, is there a delay in my voice Uh, is fine now okay so i was just saying that uh, when you write points for a project um, try not to fill in too many verbos uh, too much verbo stuff because it's possible that the interviewer may not uh, be acquainted with exactly what you've done so uh, keep it technical enough but also simple enough to understand what you've done and uh, if it's something like ml then write the metrics show the end result instead of yeah that is one thing which you should have over there yeah uh, i think you should be able to explain your project to a technical interviewer as well as uh, uh, like someone from hr so like in a layman terms as well like both of them are pretty different like i guarantee it that is also an important thing also i think in ml a lot of implementations do not have very so for example it, it is very nice if you write a result that uh, i did my i worked on some models that are 99% accuracy or something like that that's not real world model so i mean because you want you want the technical metrics to be there which is very important um do also mention competing uh, metrics as well if you feel like so for example i got an accuracy of 70% sure a person might be a person who's who's in the field would know that okay this is pretty good but if someone is in the hr you think oh only 70% so just for the benefit of the hr to also mention competing state of the art is 71 and then they, oh okay this is pretty good so and i think the most important thing is do get it reviewed by a lot of seniors like send it out to every senior you can find and uh, let them edit in specific uh, areas because every person will add something different to it and by the end of it by the end of the reviews your verbosity slash technical descriptions should have a very nice balance should not be too over the hand way it should not be very hand way but should not also be very technical because you want it to work for both get reviewed at least 10 seniors so what i have heard is i mean uh, exercise caution with this because you may get too much feedback and be uh, overwhelmed with it so take care that does not happen so i just showed it to like three people i think two of my batchmates and my dam mentor and that was it but yeah you figure it out i guess what works best for you 
So next, can we take the test preparation part? Uh, okay, so next we have the test preparation part. So can you tell about your test preparation experience and more of your story? And then we can come to the general part, the general aspect of it. Uh, so for me, uh, I had not done a lot of uh, competitive programming beforehand for the internship season, and it was around the summer vacations that I started. So I started with CF letters and uh, geeks for geeks for uh, the background in CF letter had uh, difficulty wise uh, problem set, like 100 questions uh, of a particular difficulty level and moving on to that. So uh, that helped a lot. Uh, also, I uh, all of us figured out that uh, I, we use Code Forces. So in Code Forces, there are uh, type D problem is the hardest that uh, most probably any company goes with the internship test or even in the interviews. So type D should be uh, if you are comfortable with the type D problems, then it's more than sufficient as it is. Uh, but uh, if you haven't uh, started yet, uh, do start now and uh, it's uh, enough time you can uh, get a lot done in within one and a half months or two months. So uh, do again decide if you haven't started. Just uh, start putting in the work now. Uh, one thing I feel is that uh, if you are uh, actually short of uh, short of time, then Code forces might not be the best way to, uh, you know, do competitive programming because a, a lot of questions in com uh, code forces they are based on uh, math uh, mathematics and how fast you can think things, and a lot of times they don't rely on your algorithmic knowledge that much. So, if you are short of time and you want to learn algorithms and implement them quickly, then I think you know interview specific sites like Lead Code and Hacker Rank they work uh, faster but in the long run i think code process is uh, really good so uh, you asked about our journey right uh, so, so mine was similar to ayush uh, in that uh, i started a bit early i mean just for fun and i did a little bit and then the semester came along and that got paused but when we had the so called holidays in April and we had nothing to do. Our semesters were disbanded, etc. And so that was when uh, many of us started doing and I've seen many people grow in leaps and bounds in that specific period from May to July. And so even though now is it's just the start of June uh, or no, it's midway through June. There's still a lot of time to uh, get better at coding and so what is usually done is you do code forces for a prolonged period of time and that kind of serves as a, it's more than enough for uh, these coding tests so that when you get to hacker rank and lead code they're usually um, easier in a sense and yeah as i just mentioned uh, so the problems usually are like uh, in the range of division two b c d so something uh, of those sorts and there's, there's, there are differences amongst companies but usually this is how it goes. Uh, there's this exception. I think rubric has particularly difficult questions. But uh, in general, yeah. And so doing uh, hacker rank just before uh, in the end of July or something like that, when you're preparing actually that gives you good experience of uh, because um, some companies do host it on hacker rank. Some have so the interfaces that are very similar to hacker rank. So you get a hang of that as well. Uh, to the preparation, uh, you can also add uh, past your questions of the companies like uh, uh, Sai mentioned that a uh, rubric uh, difficult questions. So you can get a hang of what uh, to expect in the coding test uh, by the previous year questions also. Not guaranteed, but yeah, it does give a good idea about what uh, what uh, what is to be expected. Sabi Sachi, can you also tell about your experience? Mine was similar to Ayush, so yeah, nothing extra to add. Uh, something I'm left, something you different you did. There must have been something. No, nope, not really. Yeah, I mean it's the general way, you know, like 
you start something then you uh, ask your friends what they are doing and then you just keep growing and yeah for the coding test part and avash yeah i mean i was not very much into competitive coding so i decided to go for the bare minimum route so uh, the bare minimum route would be you look at geeks for geeks for algorithmic implementations i i, I look for geeks for geeks i uh, at that time top coder was very famous so i was uh, at, at least some of my friends so i i went through a few questions of top coder uh, and then i just uh, for every different company uh, who's uh, jaff was opening up i would just look at their past questions and try to work on them so that that's like the bare minimum thing you can do without if if you don't want to improve your competitive coding in general but want to optimize to just get the interview test clear the uh, intern test clear if you want to improve your uh, honestly i would i would prefer i wish or uh, you know uh, everyone else is uh, way possible because that's a much more holistic way of growing but i just was very lazy so Uh, so like you mentioned in your first answer i think about resume some uh, companies like to repeat the questions uh, so does this happen here also in the technical test i, I mean there is a broad pattern that companies try to follow like uh, there are certain data structures that are much more important than others uh, no one's expecting you to there are a few data structures which are very tough to use or let's say Uh, not expected to this level, so they will not ask them. So it's not worth it to waste your time studying them. You could do it with other methods, for example. Uh, so basically, go for the simplest. Like, like for example, I I would not recommend this to people in general. But you know who you know if this would work with you. If I mean, if 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 this works for you, you know yourself best. But there is a minimum effort route as well. and that minimum effort is just seeing if there is a pattern that is emerging some companies it does some companies it does not and if that intersects with your choice of companies i mean why not who who cares how you who cares how you get to the finish line as long as you get to the finish line so uh, one thing that I, uh, i don't i wouldn't recommend is that uh, memorizing a lot of people just memorize the codes for famous algorithms because when uh, uh, like it, it you might be able to clear the interview uh, technical test but some in uh, it's very common in interviews that they ask you to write a variant of a particular algorithm or they ask you to uh, explain the code line by line and do try and and in case you try to memorize uh, stuff you won't be able to do that yeah that's very important i mean uh, e- e- even in the even in this minimum effort route you are expected to have a good understanding of the logic behind the algorithm and if not you also need to know like how to think of alternative implementations or alternative modifications to the algorithms like no one's going to they might but if they let's say don't ask you vanilla bread first search or something like that you know they might ask you some sort of a different way into so you need to know the logic to at, just to at least write a pseudo code even if you cannot write it properly in code with the syntax and everything at least be able to put a pseudo code in the interview or uh, like uh so if people are uh, familiar with geeks for geeks then you'll realize that they give for most of the algorithms they have a uh, like sequential approach like improving time complexity so that is there for a purpose like a lot of times the last the most efficient solution is difficult to think and if the interview has a lot allo- allo- allocated like 30 minutes for a particular question then a lot of times they want you to first you know give them an easier ver- uh, a less optimized version of the problem and then think of you know slowly improve the time complexity to whatever best you can give uh, rather than just spending 25 minutes on just thinking of the most optimized solution so it's good to look at like all the 
possible implementation at this position. Again, this you know ties in up with the uh, inter with how an interview is supposed to be that anyone can memorize a code and you don't really even need a person to memorize a code. It's all of it is out there. What they want to see is your understanding and that's why they test you on variance because they want to see how if given a problem how you would approach a solution so if you've memorized the most efficient method for example it's not going to help anybody because people have proposed efficient implementations in their papers they could just look it up on google why do they care for you what's so special that you're bringing to the table so you need to show your intellect so you need to be able to think of variations and even if they don't work out for example uh, this is again a thing with interviews that it is possible you might not give the right answer. They might be looking for something else. Give it your best shot. And if so, preemptively, you should also be able to identify flaws in your logic or if you're making some assumptions, if you're not able to get to it, you could highlight that. Maybe they could say, Ki, oh, so this is a sub problem you're facing. You could implement it this way. And then if that hurdle gets cleared and if you can get to the finished implementation, They'd be like, okay, he can think or she can think of the solution. There's a bit of an implementation. Sure, we can, it, but at least the thinking capability is there. So your capability gets highlighted. Uh, apart from DSA, uh, if I remember uh, right, we had. Before uh, we move on. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I was uh, going to talk about the ML uh, test uh, that we had. So ML could not, uh, for ML there was theoretical part because we cannot ask uh, technical stuff a lot. So there was theoretical stuff uh, like trees and uh, forests. So they uh, talked about that. So maybe Sai uh, cracked that one really well. So Sai can uh, tell what he actually studied for ML. I'm going to say the same thing. So coding tests are uh, ubiquitous and so they're the norm for most companies, but some have a uh, spirit test. So uh, one other thing is there are aptitude tests for some companies, uh, which also you should probably prepare, uh, especially for time management. Uh, so I think PT cell had done something around the end of July for this. If I remember, we had a series of tests, but yeah, aptitude is something you should prepare. But it's nothing like coding. I mean, so coding it takes up a lot of time, at least preparation wise, and you do a bit of the app towards the end. And about the ML uh, test, so yeah, Microsoft, uh, their ML profile had a different test. Uh, for the SWE, they had a coding test. For the uh, science profile, they had an ML test. And it was MCQ, it had around 50 questions. Uh, and yeah, it, was, it was mostly clear. I didn't do well in it, but I, what I prepared for it was uh, looking up basic Your ML. Uh, uh, your voice is breaking yeah. a bit. Is it better now? I it's better. It's better. Uh, so I was saying that uh, the Microsoft ML test had around 50 questions. It was MCQ and it, it had yeah, theoretical questions, questions on probability, questions on boosting and bagging ml techniques um i think uh pca all those sorts of things there was there was no deep learning as such it was yeah more the traditional machine learning techniques and yeah for decisions stuff like that Uh, one more thing, uh, like you mentioned, a lot of platforms. Do you have any other suggestions uh, for these test preparations? Any other platforms that you want to suggest to everyone? Uh, interview bit is also there, like lead code, I suppose. Interview bit is there. It's another side. There are tons of them, so narrowing it down is kind of difficult. I mean, geeks for geeks, they coupled with anything does the job pretty much. I think. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, Code Chef and Code Forces are very good for long term preparation, and Lead Code, uh, Hacker Rank, and Interview Bit are uh, really good for short term preparation. Because uh, 
you know most company questions like every question it it actually revolves around one of the named algorithms uh, and so that is that is a like kind of a specific kind of questions and uh, it's, uh, so if you want to improve that like that part of that kind of problem it's better to use those three platforms Or do you guys have anything more to add to the test preparation part? Uh, so last we have the interview and the resume presentation. And can you first tell about the basic time, the basic interview process, and the basic timeline of the events during an interview? What happens in an interview? I think the general, uh, like, for a typical software profile, the timeline is like they're going to de uh, describe themselves. The interviewer is going to describe himself, and then they are going to ask for an introduction of yourself. And this is like the point where they kind of get to know your your confidence level, and then they are going to, uh, you know. Ask you about some projects and know more about you, your academic history and your interests, and some general questions on the, your project and your courses you have done. This is generally around ten minutes or something, and then most the rest of the interview would proceed with some uh, like long term uh, coding questions, like half an hour, forty minutes, one hour maybe, and then it would it generally ends with some core. Technical questions like uh, maybe some questions on cryptography. You like if you have written cryptography in your resume. Uh, yeah, and then in the end, they it's almost almost always they're going to ask you to ask them a question. And people tend to say, "Oh, I don't have any questions." But uh, from what I feel, it's it, it's actually important to ask some questions. And you can always like. Uh, Memorize two or three questions which are going to ask to every interviewer. It's fine, but I think it's good if you like ask a question in the end because that uh, demonstrates your interest in the company. You can ask about his and his experience in the company, or you can ask about the internship itself. But just ask something. Uh, i also feel that uh, the two questions your intro part and the uh, last question for the interview you can uh, have a, it prepared beforehand because every interviewer will ask these two questions for sure to you and uh, as uh, tarish said it will uh, share confidence and interest in the company and this uh, this uh, uh, for hr interviews also uh, there is a different format for hr interviews as well so if uh, someone ha has an experience they can tell about that I mean, I think uh, the last point that Tarush mentioned is extremely important because uh, while your uh, technical questions in the algorithm design or uh, your interest-based uh, questions are something that you can handle with preparation, uh, the introduction to the general interview and your uh, and and the finishing remarks, more importantly, need to be strong because. Sure, a lot of people are nervy when they're sitting down for an interview. So at the starting, you might be a bit shaken. They can see that you might be feeling a bit scared. But honestly, what you want is even if you've had a weak start, you want to lean into the interview. You want to get comfortable in your skin, so that when the final questions come, that is the point where they're actually asking you to take control of the interview. Now you have the now now it's your cue to ask the interview about anything. So. you want to ask about the company sure you want to ask about interesting prospects of the company what exactly does the company think uh, of itself you uh, what does the interview uh, interviewer's history or something what was they what were they looking for in general if they had any comments about your performance in the interview any technical things that you might want to ask or any innovations or anything that you think 
they can they can tell you about the interview uh, about the company uh, and everything uh, do make sure you have a good set of questions for that and uh, it's important to exude confidence and please do not even, because these are the things that while you that you're preparing for in in, in advance but just don't uh, parrot it out in one in one go like for example uh this is me this is this is this don't like when you're introducing yourself don't just say the things out immediately because that shows nervousness that shows uh that you've memorized something you've prepared it beforehand stagger it let it feel organic when you're taking control of the interview in the last finishing questions don't just blurt them out because then this is just a standard tactic that's used by everyone you need to make yourself good in the eyes of the interviewer you need to ensure that it feels organic not forced not memorized and specific to the interview uh, one thing that helped helps me in my interviews is specific to the interview during the final comments when you are the one asking question do also make if possible do also make some callbacks to the interview experience as such so for example during the interview you come across you've been given some task or if that person has asked you something and you reply to something and they've talked about that okay we were looking for this or this anything that any topic of conversation that has happened in the interview if possible try and make a call back to it in a in, in as part of a different question so that this becomes your variant uh, a variable question per interview this shows that you were actually involved within the interview process and uh, a lot of interviews especially the hr interviews they are very interested in this because hr will not be going for the technical thing but they'll be mostly seeing your confidence so this this is very helpful in general for interviews you want to impress them also uh, like for the hr round you should be prepared with all the cliche questions like uh, why did you choose this company and stuff like why didn't you uh you know if you had if you have some previous internship why didn't you join them full time and stuff like this and like a very a very popular question is uh, some bad qualities about yourself that is a very trick uh, it's, a, it's a trick question because if you say i don't have a bad quality it means you are or you or think too highly of yourself if you speak of some bad quality that might affect the company and you again may get rejected so you have to speak something which is negative but is still something positive uh, and if in the nervousness you do happen to mention a bad quality that they're not that that, that they're not going to like just try and pivot it in such a way that it becomes uh, marketable like you are selling to them okay i had this but see i am i am doing this about it but see i can use this like that so show how that bad quality is actually a, is a benefit like don't do it in general like you, you don't have to make every bad quality good quality because again that's also a cliche trope i mean what are your bad qualities oh i work too hard no that's like extremely cliche <laughs> but uh, show some personality have have fun around it and as tarush uh, as tarush said uh, don't don't let it be a very serious bad quality but if in if in the nerves of the moment you do happen to do so then please pivot it and please sell it as a good thing because it will help you so like you guys mentioned the hr and the technical interviews uh, can you tell how they how they are different the main, the main points where where they are different like you told about the cliched uh, questions and what questions are covered in the technical unit uh yeah well so in technical round so the interviewer will be like what do you know basically it's about you and in the hr round just like what value will bring to the company yeah so they are fundamentally different in that way and there are some standard questions on the net so maybe you can go through those too about in the about the hr thing i mean
Also, can you tell about your interview experience and your takeaways from your uh, from that experience? Yeah. I think we can start with Sabir Sachi. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for my interview, I freaked out a lot before both of them. That's for one thing. So, like, don't freak out, basically. And uh, prepare that introduction well. So basically, tell me about yourself. It's like a huge thing to your confidence. And after that, it's pretty okay. You get in the flow and you tell up all you know. So hmm. yeah, and the HR one was well okay. I don't really remember actually. Yeah, so Tarush, you're up. Um, okay, so I'll share three of the blunders that I did, which I would recommend no one to do. Uh, so first, first, first of it would be, uh, well, you are writing code in a technical interview. Do not rush through the code. Like suppose you have done the question thousand times, you do not have to show that to the interview interviewer you have to present it in a manner that you are thinking it first time and you just like if, suppose there is one hour reserved for a question so if you write, write the code in 10 minutes and take the rest 50 minutes to explain it to him it's, it's not going to create a good impression rather like so what i eventually learned was first give a, a bigger picture of what the whole thing would be so take five minutes to explain what what is the approach and what is the design then write the code step by step keep good variable names and you know ask for help in between if needed because if you explain it line by line he'll he'll be happy to debug it along along with you but if you write it in two minutes and then there is some bug then he won't be able to help you so it's important to explain the code uh, side by side and Keep the code tidy and formatted. And uh, so this is something I didn't do in some of the companies, and it obviously had a bad Im impact. And another blunder is do not uh, tell them anything about your ranking of the or like your preferences of the companies. That is going to be like a very bad idea because if that company is below any other company, they are directly going to reject you. Like they might trick you into like answering that, but uh, like always try to avoid that question. And thirdly, um, uh, do not, they might ask you about why you rejected a certain company or why you didn't uh, go full time into a certain company. Like, uh, for example, I did a certain internship in, after my first year. So, one of the com interviews, he asked me why I didn't uh, like. Do, uh, like continue full time with them or like do an internship again with them and i ended up giving some uh, bad points about that company uh, another problem is that uh, that makes me a picky person and every company is going to have those some of those bad points so that implies that uh, you know if these problems ever occur in that company i'm going to like leave the company and they always look for full-time employees in their interns. So you should never uh, give bad points about any company or like never give any kind of bad feedback about any uh, any of your uh, past internships or past uh, companies. Yeah, so I mean, that's, uh, Tarush has actually put amazing points and uh, once again, I'll highlight the importance of being able to pivot around these questions. So, for example, in my HR interview, this guy started asking me about what I thought of the company. And I didn't know what to say. So I started thinking of, and, and this is, I guess, a lucky stroke, but I started thinking of things that the company was doing. I think I'd seen them in some advertisement or some product or something. So I started uh, pivoting to that side. And I guess by the end of the interview, we were probably discussing about uh, that topic I just managed to I guess distract and towards a, a few minutes later we were I think talking about 
uh, how poorly RCB is playing and Kohli and all that shit. So, I mean, you can actually pivot questions around if you are friendly enough with the interviewer. The interview also needs to be chill, but then you need to make that person chill as well. Uh, HR, for example, this is very important, as Taru said, that you do not want to show that that company is bad. I mean, companies typically, uh, this is like your testing period for potential employees. A lot of companies try to get a lot of their employees through the intern program. So it's a good idea that you show that you are probably one of those people who do, who does not hop around between companies because it's a cost to the company. Company has to spend time on training you. You'll be the first. You'll be there. Uh, they'll be your first employer. So they'll spend a lot of time training you. So it takes their resources. And then if you get the training and then just jump to some other con- company, it's a loss for them. So they want to see some sort of stability from you. They want to see some sort of commitment from your side and also that. There are a lot of people who would do anything for a job at that company. We as IITians tend to think that we have so many offers that oh, this company is beneath us or that. But do realize that there are a lot of people who would do anything for a chance that you're getting. So, And while the technical people might be impressed by you, the HR people are less forgiving in that regard. So do ensure that you don't make them feel disrespected. Let it be a mutually respectable, like, you know, there should be some sort of a mutual respect, especially for HR. Um, For technical, for example, there can be a frustrating, it can be frustrating at times. So I, uh, during one of my technical interviews, not all of them, but like uh, during one of my technical interviews, this guy has asked me about some question. And he's asking me again, he's like the CS guy. I explained it to him that the CSA of doing things. Okay, cool. He's happy. And then he's like, can you think of something else? I give him another solution. Can you think of something else? Then I pull in my electrical background and I give that person a solution from the electrical side. Now this person is clueless. He's like, but how does this happen? I'm like, this is this. Eventually he disagreed with me over the solution. Now, I don't know what to do with that. Do I fight with that person because it's a valid solution? Or do I just let it slide? So there are times when this can happen in an interview. Don't fight with the interviewer. Don't mean that person that person holds the cards just try to explain your point and lastly engage the interviewer as taru said do not give the solution at the same moment start off in a very staggered step even if you know everything even if you don't know everything or if you know everything the same thought can apply you see a question you don't start solving the minute you see a question or the minute you get a question you start thinking about it. so do show a minute or two to think about it like okay huh and then you think about it and then you're thinking and you're showing that you're thinking and then you can say oh off the top of my head i think this implies this is this and i will be approaching for this solution because this seems optimal this seems easy to do you need to show that person how you're thinking you want to give them a peek inside your head and the benefit is that for example if you're pre-prepared with the answer then those two minutes that you are prepared the, the, the two minutes that you're pretending to show that you're thinking of a solution, you can use those as a breather to calm your nerves down and get more confident so that you can handle the engaging aspect of the interview better. And even if you know every step, it is best that you find some trivial part within the interview where you get that person to help you out. Even if you know everything, it's probably... Let's say you you think of the idea, you've thought of the algorithm, you've written the pseudocode, you've engaged the person. Let's say you're trying to implement it and write a proper code for it. Sure, you might be good in that language. You can just say, oh, I'm, I'm more familiar with this language. Is this syntax correct? Or is this that correct? It gets them involved. They see how, uh, they see that you're willing to ask questions. You're not ashamed of not knowing anything. Because you will not be knowing everything at the same time. So you need to show that you're not ashamed of asking questions. Asking questions is the first step to learn. So do get that interview inter- interviewer to engage with you, to help you out. And at the same time, don't be a know-it-all who just blurts it out like a parrot. Uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, firstly, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are. Yeah, so I, when you asked Sabya about the interviews, so I gave one DE show interview and uh, so in the Microsoft, there were three rounds. Just wanted to uh, go over them in a high, high level fashion. So 
yeah the first round involved uh, coding uh, like dsa questions and so there was a variety so in one question they asked me to write code and send it to them uh, proper code which they didn't test or anything but uh, they wanted me to write code for the d show interview i think uh, they had an editor and they wanted me to actually write code and run it uh, and in the first round of the microsoft interview they asked me a few ml questions as well uh, the second round was more open ended Uh, in the sense that they posed a sort of a practical type question which had no solution which they just wanted to see uh, the sort of ideas uh, we could discuss and that was that and the third round was i think about my projects no sorry the second round also involved uh, some questions particularly on deep learning so they wanted to delve a bit deeper into what i knew so uh, it is here that they kind of ask you what you want to be quizzed upon because Yeah, they know that you don't know everything, so that comes in. And yeah, as someone already said, probably don't fib around uh, and beat around the bush. Tell them frankly what you know and what you don't know. Although, and tell them when you're ideating something and you don't know it. You're just wondering that probably this is something that can be done, or probably this is something that is done. So be clear, be honest about that. And yeah, uh, so. don't ramble i mean it, there's no hurry it, it's it's a proper lengthy interview so don't rush into things as has already been mentioned and take time to compose yourself compose your thoughts and have a have a normal discussion and this is when people tend to panic i mean even i did but so take that extra minute take that extra to take those extra few seconds to calm yourself in that particular situation and yeah there's no hurry essentially that was the primary advice which i found helpful there's no hurry in the interview you just it's just a casual conversation about some technical things some things about yourself and uh i would i don't necessarily agree with the pretending part though i mean if you do know the answer then uh, to a question they've asked it's like uh you have to show them that you know and not just the code itself right so you have to step them through the process and that itself takes time so it's not like so when you write code tell them what you're thinking beforehand and so, so i think that's what they meant they didn't mean pretending as such but yeah just to clarify and what is in the hr section yeah uh, so they ask you things like if you're applying for an ml job then why ml what is it that brought you here what is it that got you excited about ml stuff like that they might ask you why you interested in the company and you probably will have some reasons um uh, except Uh, I mean, think of some reason and don't go over the board with this. Just think of some simple reasons why you would like to join the company, and prepare all these all this stuff beforehand. Because I, if I was asked these things, I had no reply to them. They were technical things were fine, but these things. Um, so yeah, prepare them beforehand. What else? That, that's about it. Uh, i would also like to add upon what akash was saying about engaging the interviewer so one thing you can do is like whenever they ask the question you can uh, get clarifications at the moment because with me it happened during the interview that uh, they did not give the complete problem statement there was some part of it missing uh, which uh, the sooner you ask uh, the better the solution you will be able to come up with and they had intentionally left it out they wanted you to ask it so uh, do clarify that part also and uh, uh whenever you are thinking uh just speak out what you are thinking also uh, like if you are building a solution incrementally first you are giving an on square then you are going to go to on so uh, take them uh, whenever you are not uh, writing anything uh, just take them uh, through what you are what's going on in your mind so in this way also you can take control of the interview in a manner so that's and also if it ever happens to come in a technical or an hr interview about why like for example sai was mentioning that if you why do you want to do this why this why not that then you know it's a good idea to have a list of probably things that are not present within that field which are working innovation that let's say something you've read in a lecture but is not in a product or depending on the type of company that is in the type of profile but then these innovative solutions do not exist 
uh, I would like to work on something like that. Or just propose a few ideas. If it ever comes up as a question, prepare a few list of generic uh, ideas that you would like to implement or work on. That way, it shows that you're actually, you know, uh, interested in the field and not just following the herd. Because ML, for example, is a very crowded landscape at the moment. Everyone wants to do ML. Like, people, at this point, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that people will start saying, can a for loop be written better? Let's write ML to find out an optimal for loop. I am not sure what they're going to do with ML. They're putting ML in everything where it's not even needed. So be very, uh, so do have these innovative things at times. Uh, it'll help. One last thing, uh, do work on uh, work on the indentation of your code because the interviewer is going to read it. He's not, uh, uh, he'll read the code, uh, so do indent it properly. Uh, it's something that we uh, tend to look upon. So uh, do indent properly. Also, there's uh, one component, uh, like generally second year people don't know about and it's it's about the design. So there is a class of problems called design problems. Some companies ask it, some don't. But I'll share one of my interviews on design. And like it was a rubric interview. And it was a general interview. Like they asked me about myself and some questions. And they said, okay, we have one hour. And you have to design Minesweeper. Like I think everyone would have played it. And they didn't give me, like, there was no other information, nothing about the UI or anything. And so I just made, like, I just chose a bunch of variables. I made a bunch of functions and I made some kind of a version of Minesweeper and it was running fine. Uh, and I explained it to them and everything, it, things were fine. Uh, but after the interview, within 30 seconds, they told me that I'm rejected. So I contacted one of my seniors who was selected in rubric to tell him about, like, to ask him where did I go wrong, and he said that it was a design interview, and it, it's actually a bit different from a normal uh, competitive coding problem. So in a design interview, like, you generally, uh, you have to design, uh, like, a real-world real world object, and you have, in which, like, things could be arbitrary. There is no uh, deterministic, uh, you know, result, uh, unlike a normal CP problem. And so in the beginning, in such situations, like it could be like design an elevator, design a, a game, design maybe like an airport. Uh, in such situations, first you have to give them a description of what you think about that uh, object, for example, uh, uh, like or a class, as they say, in object-oriented programming. So think of uh, Minesweeper as a, as a class, and you have to describe what what are the things it does what are the associated variables, and what are all the associated functions. And then while coding also, you have to make a class, and you have to you know, or de describe all the variables and functions associated with them, and then run it in a main program, and not like a usual uh, code. So this is also something that you can easily practice online. You can look for design problems. Uh, yeah, so the point is that they're different from normal uh, CP problems. And even in general, whenever you're coding, don't like a like I started said, don't make it monolithic. Like don't put everything in main. Um, but also, whenever you're uh, trying to write some or uh, implement some data structure or anything, let's say if they ask you to do that, try to think of ways in which your code can be the cleanest. I mean, there is there is a way of performing certain action which would do which would work in, let's say, three nested for loops with a lot of if conditions, that is a very unclean code. Alternatively, if you frame the problem a bit differently, and if your data structure is modified just slightly, it's possible it reduces to one for loop with one if condition. I mean, that's a much better way of showing it. So if you can get to that, if you can add modularity to your code, and if you can ensure that it is not very complicated, that helps. It also helps you because the more complicated code you write, the higher chances that they'll it will not work and you will get more flustered because you will be wanting to debug it and you will not be able to debug it because it is so complicated that you yourself will have to track okay this is happening and this and this and this is better to just track one thing so over the dsa sessions i will give you an example uh, i'll give you a few examples of this uh, but yeah
Uh, do you guys have anything else to add? Or else we can move to the form and chat questions if you want. Because we are pretty much done with the discussion part. Uh, shall we take up the form and uh, chat questions? Yeah, sure. OK, so uh, I'll just go through them really quickly. Uh, so we got this in the form, a registration form. Uh, so the first question is type of data structures uh, which came in your interviews. Can you tell about the type of data structures that came in your interviews? I think for me it was stack and uh, uh, DP problem. So it was arrays of vector what I need to use. For me, it was uh, stack you, uh, DP and graphs. I had questions on link uh, list, link lists and stack, and I think one DP question. Yeah, I had primarily on DP and graph. Mine was in, mine was in arrays, and it was like pretty trivial, so. Uh, so the next question we received in the chat is, does ML or data analysis profile also have a DSA test? So I'm not sure about uh, Adobe, but so Microsoft ML profile did not have a DSA test. Um, I'm not sure about what happened. What was the situation for Adobe? Does someone else remember? Uh, I think uh, doing DSA, even if you're going from uh, for ML profile, uh, you should know DSA because more often than not, you'll encounter DSA problems. Oh yeah, and as I said, so in the interview, they did ask DSA, so even though they did not have a test on it, but it was tested eventually. Okay, uh, and uh, one very important question is what is the importance of CPI for internships? I think they are uh, important. Uh, uh, like some companies have a CPI cutoff for tests. Other than that, if you have a decent CPI around 8, 8.5, that's more than enough. Uh, it does. Uh, play into your selection, but it is not the sole criteria and it is not the main criteria. That is for sure. It has so some weightage are... and the weightage is different for every company. Yeah, exactly. So there are a few companies which prioritize which are CPI and T, but uh, there are just a few. In general, you should be fine. I mean, it will be very rare to come across a company which says that you need to have a CPI of nine to just apply. So that's not going to probably happen. Most of them, most of companies, if I remember correctly, say that if you are above 7.5 or 8, then they'll probably be eligible to sit for the test. And I think after that, your performance within the test and interview matters more than your CPI. Although uh, an argument can be made that if your CPI is higher and if, let's say, you've performed similarly to someone else in interviews, then you can get a preference there in case the profile is very limited. Right? The number of whenever they are confused between two people, they'll go with the CPI. Yeah, like if there's no clear cut advantage to anyone, they'll take CPI because that's the only metric they have to work upon. So it, it's a bit important, but it's not the end of the world. And a lot of people asked uh, where they can find the past year questions of companies. Like, can you suggest some specific resource? Uh, Geeks for Geeks and interview bit will search, they'll uh, find questions. That, uh, this uh, question was asked in this interview, something like that. It's pretty easy. They can search on GFG interview bit. So. Uh, 
lot of questions around DNA, uh, DSA. Uh, so which language uh, is preferred for DSA? Which language would you suggest? I guess everyone has a different preferences, but personally I go with C++ because it's fast and fast because uh, a few people are comfortable in Java, but Java is it's slower, takes more memory, so you, your performance might be worse if they're not having a staggered, like some tests, for example, they will have different limits for Java and for C++, but then if they do not, then you are at an inherent disadvantage with Java. So for example, I prefer C++, it's very fast. Uh, there is a caveat when it comes to uh, C++ though, and that is if they allow the use of STL or not. Because if they do not allow the use of STL, then you need to be able, then you need to be very comfortable with pointers because everything happens with pointers then. If you do get basic STL like vectors, your life is sorted. You can do anything with it. But if you do not, then uh, I mean, but C++ is my preferred language any day. Yeah, like I used to use C++ if STL is available, otherwise Python. Yeah, so. yeah, actually there was a question about STL. So it depends on the companies, right? If they are allowing STL or not. Yeah, generally, but sometimes you'll notice that it's not an, it's not already imported there in the code, but you can actually import it on your own and people and some people actually miss that like what what actually happens is some companies they give you a default code and only some part of it is editable and you will feel like the import part is not editable and you can't use SQL but they're like sometimes like can be edited and you can import it here. I mean, if it's not editable, generally they put a, put slashes or something like you can only edit this part and something. If they didn't mention anything, maybe you're free. You're okay to go. Also, uh, if I remember right, there was an, uh, with one inter, uh, uh, internship test where it happened that uh, solving a problem with Python was so much easier than doing it in uh, C++. So you can look into that if you have a basic knowledge of Python in both the languages. So if you can, you, uh, you can look into that. If I, if I also might say, at least uh, for my company, at least I can say, uh, some companies are very rigid about what languages they allow for coding as well at times. So for example, when it was my turn, they did not allow us the use of Python or anything else. So the only options we had was C++ and Java at that time. Uh, in a sense, especially considering that you want to learn, I would recommend that start off with C++. I mean, for your for building concepts, there is nothing better than writing implementations from scratch in C++, from learning in C++. Obviously, once you start practicing uh, competitive coding from different websites, sure, you can do it in Python to save time because there'll be a lot of questions that you'll be doing. So it saves time, if it, it, sure, Python. But also ensure that you have a healthy practice in C++ because worst comes to worst and the most stringent criteria in the world can be imposed, but everyone will allow C++. Yeah, so we got this really big question from YouTube. Uh, is machine learning hyped up or are there enough opportunities in the, in the industry? We got this from someone on YouTube. So the answer would be that it is hyped up and there are big opportunities in the, in the industry. Um, the opportunities lie depending on every company. Uh, there's a lot of B2B things that are happening which would immensely benefit from machine learning. Uh, scientific research, for example, is taking a huge improvement because of ML. For example, uh, physics and all uh, physics and all analysis. For example, this is uh, Kepler telescope which found out two planets because they were because some machine learning algorithm predicted it and you, the scientists were not able to find out by their heuristic method. So it has big implications, but trivial things everyone is doing with machine learning. So it is very hyped up. For most problems, at times, linear regression 
does work. It's it's not about it's not whether you need a fancy neural net for everything. A lot of problems just come down to simple K-means classification or uh, so people just like to use the word. There's a lot of money there, so people like to okay, we'll do AI. VCs be like okay, we'll give you money. Like, ah, okay, so let's take the money. Who cares? <laughs> so the hype is real, but the significance is also real. Uh, uh, like you mentioned, uh, it is a very important part in the interview. The question you asked at the end. So, what questions did you ask, Philip? Uh, what would you just suggest to ask the interviewers at the end? The questions that you used or prepared from the beginning. I think all of you can answer this. Philip, the questions you prepared before going to the interview. I will go first. I think I asked uh, one was uh, the interview, what uh, project they are working on. Uh, other thing I used to ask was, uh, what can I expect from my project if I get the internship? Uh, these are the main two things I used to ask for the interviewers at different different times, so you don't need to have a lot of questions. Yeah, I think I used questions are uh, also what I uh, used to ask, but apart from that, I also sometimes used to ask some questions personal to the interviewer, like how has his journey been with the XYZ company? And certain times I also ask things like, uh, which I actually wanted to know, like how is the management and tech relationship at that company? And I think some of the HRs actually love to answer that descriptively. So yeah, you, it's, uh, you can ask anything just as long as you're asking something. Uh, one more thing, one more question. Uh, are majority of the shortlists based on the coding test or resumes? Or is there some additional factor as well? Combination of both. I also didn't get this question very. <laughs> Again, uh, the ratio is dependent on the company. There is also a possibility that you uh, get one of the highest scores in a test and still don't get shortlisted. I wouldn't name the company, but one of the companies did that at time. Like even the people who scored full full marks were not shortlisted because they didn't have like very high CPI. So it will happen, and just you don't have to like just don't think bad about any company and just. Uh, Move on. And it's also possible that you do everything right, but still don't get selected. So never take it to your heart. Is this possible that the company decision making is flawed? You don't have to think bad of the company or about yourself. Shit happens. It's life. Oh yeah. I mean, the like, uh, think of it like uh, there was. Uh, don't think of it like you. Uh, they didn't think. Uh, they, they don't think that you are a deserving candidate. Think of it like, you know, their project won't match your, uh, you know, interests or your, just, just an incompatibility issue. And it's often, there's a lot of luck factor which goes unmentioned. So, yeah, don't take it to your heart. You, you don't know what will happen. You just have to do your best and hope for the best. So I think there were two, three questions about the scope of non CS students uh, for ML or software internships. So can you talk about that? A lot of people are from CS department only, but do you have any idea about that? Non CS means I'm people who are not. I know you are not from CS, but the rest of them is from CS. Yeah, I mean, they can apply like it's all out of the internet, so you can just learn stuff. You know, I mean, I don't know about I don't really know much much about the day one companies, but as it as the days pass by, like day two, day three, like my my company was open, and only two people are there there from CS. So yeah, 
in many companies are open for all. They're, they're usually open for all. And if, if suppose you have a project in ML or anything or any development related thing, you can actually make it as a selling point because then you can actually go in with the attitude that, you know, I have done ML projects, so I have experience in the field, but I'm also from another field, so I have experience there as well. So now I'm a cross field person who can think of new ideas just beyond the CS thinking regime. That's what at least how I posit myself and companies like it. So... Um, there, there is no, uh, if the company allows, and most companies do allow to uh, other people to apply for it, if they do it, then sell it as a benefit that you're not in CS, that everyone is doing ML, I'm also doing ML. So I know everything, I, I know I know other things that CS guys don't know. I, I, I know mech, I know elec, I, I, I know other things. So I'm a better candidate, you should choose me. That's how you should be approaching it. Yeah, I think, uh, I think yes, you yes, try yes. to sell every, like, try to sell everything that you have. So, like you mentioned, projects hold a very uh, valuable spot in a resume. So, uh, can you suggest uh, some projects that they can do in a month for uh, to add to the resume? Some projects. I think Coursera has some capstone project courses. Uh, I think I'm not sure whether they're doable within a month, but I think those can be a very quick and easy way to get through to an to an ML project or any like you know whatever course you like. And again, the problem is that with these capstone projects, you are expected to have a lot of knowledge of the previous courses. Maybe you can just take it up as you go along. This is one option that comes to my mind. I guess others can chime in, obviously. Uh, I'm not sure, but maybe uh, Kaggle has some projects or some long challenges, something like that. That can help. At times, I think uh, Kaggle does have competitions from companies that actually want to use, uh, and this is ML specific again, but for example, there was a very famous Netflix challenge that Kaggle had once. Uh, on which you were supposed to create an algorithm that would actually be used for Netflix. Uh, I, I think those opportunities may be there, but you'll have to check. One month is kind of a short time, or you can convince a professor. If you can convince a professor, it's some, uh, in the name of some applications, I mean, better than that. Uh, so there's a question. Uh, how do things differ for the dual degree students when it comes to internships? Is there a difference? I think some of them are debarred from uh, doing internships in their third year or something after the third year, but not very sure of that. I've also heard the same that uh, due, uh, because of an extra year, their internship uh, internships are generally one year late, uh, late than the four year uh, courses. And if you're a dual degree student and you don't get an internship, don't really take it to your heart because technically you're going out with a master's equivalent degree which is already qualified as two years of experience by the industry so rather if you don't get an internship in a company try to get a project uh, from a professor that will even enhance your profile even more you spend one year more at the campus but then you get two years worth of experience in, uh, on your profile so, so don't really it doesn't really matter if you don't get an internship Uh, so next, we have a question specific to you, Akash. Uh, it's about Samsung's internship opportunity and their selection procedure. Right. Um, what exactly about it? Uh, in general, it's just you know, standard. I think about your experience, I think. What was yes, your... I mean, we had... We had a technical test. We had uh, 
a technical coding test uh, followed by a technical interview which i guess lasted for an hour or so uh, again I, i i told you i think about the the interviewer who got confused about one of the solutions and then we had to discuss that at length so that guy kept everyone else waiting for those beard uh, and then there's the hr again uh, but you know pretty standard uh, procedure uh yes so next question is like you said ki they conduct the aptitude and coding rounds but do it companies also conduct english rounds it's a question not that i know yeah. i don't know i know company tells me not in our internship season also there was no english test uh, per se Only the interviews were supposed to be uh, in Indian English, and that conversation in English, no exam was required. Ha. So the next question is, uh, like you mentioned, uh, it is very important to avoid the question about the preference of the companies. So how do you avoid that? Some suggestions. How do you dodge that question? i was asked once and i answered it and i got rejected so i shouldn't be the one answering this yeah i i was asked this once uh, about the preference of the companies and uh, i kind of painted it to their advantage basically that so it's not like so basically there was a, so initially i posited it as a as, as them being a good company and everything then they were like but why uh, but students prefer google for example or should prefer microsoft and uh, google does this google has android and like okay how do you want to we basically try to worm worm you into a hole basically so then you i i guess you try to find out something that google does that and then for example that's what i did i i was like okay but they do this but it's a limited scope you do this better be happy uh or you can i think this was one of the uh, times this happened the other time it was happened is i kind of as i told you i changed the topic slightly to go into some of their strengths i guess and diverted the topic away from competition with companies uh if you don't really have any answer you can also always for example with smaller companies or startups if this question ever comes up uh you can always go with this tried and tested formula that sure we can uh, sure google might be better but then the so with a startup they know that google is better for example if they ask you in comparison there's no denying it but then this can be taken as a positive point sure they might be better but we see that because of their size they don't have as many innovative projects to work on they don't have as much scope for growth we want to work and we want to do something innovative so you posit that as a positive now so you being small can also be a strength because you can disrupt the market so if you cannot think of any pros for a company versus the other paint it so that you think at it as a disruptor of the bigger company uh so now we are down to the last three questions uh, how do we assure them uh, that we are suited for the work if we are beginners it's a very open <laughs> i think uh, what they uh, need they don't need to assure them uh, uh, they need to just show that they are capable of uh, whatever they uh, throw their way they can learn and uh, solve a problem like thinking on their feet and such skills they don't expect you to uh, know the technical skills at the uh, time of the selection process so that's one thing and towards the end of the interview you can always give them an assurance that we are uh, like you are a fast learner that there is a year gap between them selecting you for inter- inter- internship and then you actually doing the internship during which time you will take up these these courses give them uh, if if it ever comes to that companies do not usually ask but then you can actually chalk out a battle plan for them that these courses are relevant in our profession in our 
uh, college, I'll take up these courses. I'll, I'll do this. So you get them, you give them the assurance that sure, I'll be ready for it. Uh, so next question is, uh, wait, uh, what sort of background is required to get a data science internship? So I don't know. I actually just uh, talked about this whole while. Uh, having a few ML projects is about it, I guess. I mean, the rest of it is common to across all uh, the SW people as well to the best of my knowledge uh, and uh, the last question is are there any specific internship portals that we can apply through i think there's the institute portal where all the companies uh, come that's, I don't know what they want to ask the question. I mean, PTCL has a portal, everyone uses that. So I, mean, I don't really yeah, see how. Except they... for that. Except for that. We can act, you should actually look through the portal and, you know, look through what are all the opportunities and what kind of tests. There's a lot of information. Maybe contact I mean, people who are selected. Yeah, maybe you can contact people who have not been selected for PT cell. They might know better about this, I suppose. Um, but uh, there are PT cell rules as well uh, that if you are going through PT cell, then you should not be going uh, off campus, I think. So do keep that in mind. Uh, we just got two more questions. Can we take them as well? If it's okay. How much code forces rating region is required? Ah, uh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. How how many code forces rating uh, region is required for having good impression? I think. Uh, Normally, no one goes around and uh, tells the interviewer their rating, and they also don't ask uh, directly. If you're, uh, like you said, uh, for code force, if you're uh, able to solve division two B C D problems uh, fairly uh, regularly in the contest and all, so then you are uh, too good. And uh, the last question is for ML tests from where should one prepare for theory and MCQ tests that you mentioned for specifically ML? I think I had read uh, blogs, so medium and uh, stuff like that. It was just a day or two before the exam. So uh, we Google and find some blogs which have a, a broad overview of the things. And then you can narrow down through the blog. So I mean, I, I, I'm hoping that if you're asking for ML specific preparation, then you've already gone through the classical resources like Andrew and you or something similar so that you have at least a few basic uh, concepts to grasp. But then, uh, as uh, Sai mentioned, we can, uh, there's this very good blog on Medium called Towards Data Science. So they have a very nice analysis of uh, uh, a, a lot of algorithms. So you can see that. There's also one more thing that I would mention, which actually can give you a bit of an edge when it compares to other people, is that Google uh, has an AI blog. And in that, they have a section for courses in which you can actually uh, see uh, there. It's, the reason is that they do not go as much into the explanation of the concepts, but rather into why would you use a specific technique for what. So the application-specific nature of that blog gives you something that I have not found in any other resource for ML. Everyone says this, 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 this exists, and there's a mathematical for it. But then if you want to justify why you use X technique or Y technique in a real world product or anything, I don't think there's a better resource than that uh, courses of Google AI blog. They're very very uh, easy, and uh, they have TensorBoard uh, built in into the session so that you can actually 
uh, tweak and see their recommendations actually coming uh, in action like why are they useful you see that you are on mute इंटरव्यूज in general i think it's not like you should know uh, cpp java python one of these i think that's it with the questions and thanks a lot uh, for being the panelist and for the session for conducting the session and are there any last advices from your side for everyone in general i would say uh, especially because we are targeting our college so i would say this is a very generic advice that applies to that is not often repeated within our college because everyone is extremely driven towards being the best uh, and, and it might work out for those who are at the top but it probably does not work out for everyone so the advice is that Uh, during college you will feel like you are somewhere in the average or in the middle or in the lower but remember that we're talking about the top 1% ka average which means you're still in the top 1% which means you're still very good and because of that you should never undersell yourself whatever you have it is good work on it make it better no issues don't let that be anything that hampers your motivation even for interviews and everything be confident you are a great candidate companies want you they want others as well but companies want you more within our college it is very easy to see that uh, you you start thinking in terms of your classes but you stop forgetting you stop forgetting about the bigger picture so bigger picture is that never undersell yourself and always uh, be confident mental health is very important uh, do not mess up your mental health because you did not get into through a company's interview or through a test does not matter mostly it's a second year just keep practicing you will be better you will be fine one one more thing which i think i think went unmentioned so help each other out i mean it's a it's a even though you're competing against each other in some sense uh but it does help a lot like and i've seen people i mean it's like if you get rejected on day 1 for example then people make it out to be a much bigger deal than it is when that is accentuated by facebook posts and all so just be there for each other and i actually had a mock interview with one of my friends and we regularly discuss stuff one week before the interview how we we'll explain our resume points stuff like that so uh, yeah do it together you will all do much better yeah this thing really helps uh, you get through the inter- uh, internship period season really well uh, with the friends and hard to just keep your head down and keep working don't let any of uh, the uh, uh, setbacks uh, demotivate you just keep working uh, most companies actually select on uh, an absolute basis so it's not like if uh you know if, if there are two people like if you are better than the other they select only you and not him they can select both of you or they can reject both of you so collaboration would always help uh do you want to add anything else so i think that's it and uh, thank you for thank you again and just a reminder after releasing the lecture uh, zero will also be releasing the dsa booklets and uh, to help solve the dsa booklets the day after the release 
uh, I, Akash will be holding the technical sessions, uh, which will be conducted from the 13th to 27th June. And make sure you attend those as well for your better preparation. And thanks for attending the session. And thanks again, the, uh, thanks again to the panelists for conducting the session. All the best. Thanks a lot for you guys.